Hello, it's good to see everybody here. And um, I was going to introduce myself, but I guess I don't have to, because was, that was just done for me. But I will take the moment to give a little plug for Women in Agile. And it's, it's really a great movement. Um, there is an activity, um, an event going on tomorrow evening that there's a lot of people around here that know about it. I unfortunately will not be able to be present, but there's a lot of wonderful, wonderful people who have put that together for everybody. And so just a heartfelt invitation for everyone out here to attend. So why are you here? Well, I'm here to talk to you about, I guess, cross-functionality and what it is and what it isn't and product development flow and disconnects from the customer whole. Nah, that talk is garbage. You guys already know that stuff. What I actually wanted to start with is I have a dirty little secret. I'm gonna address the elephant in the room here. I'm not a tester. <laughs> I think you guys already figured that out. Sorry. <laughs> and you know what? I used to be the worst enemy of testers, I'm sure, when I was a developer, because I was that developer that had that code that I was positive was defect free. Yep. Might have brought down the few sites once or twice. So now it's, it's really going down for real. The song seemed like a better idea when I picked it. But what I wanted to talk to you about is the fact that I know a couple important things about testing. I know that we should test all the things, and I know that we should automate all the things, and I did read Lisa and Janet's book. And I didn't just read it for this conference, I read it before. <laughs> but that being said, I was really, really nervous to come up here because I thought, you know what? My face is gonna go blank, and then your faces are gonna go blank, and then the slide's gonna go blank. Ah, oh, shit. Slide did go blank. But testing was not something that was part of my identity. And I told you before that I was a developer, but that isn't really a part of my identity anymore either. That was a long time ago. And so really what I feel like up here <laughs> is I feel like an imposter. I feel like a duck in a tux, or in this case, a dress. Maybe not so much a duck, but I know there's been some great talks about imposter syndrome here as well, and also about um, being an introvert, which I am as well. So with that, I'm going to go sit over here in the corner, and you guys can just read my slides. <laughs> but when I was asked to do this keynote, I really felt like an imposter. And at that point, I had just started working at CA. I've been there for seven months now, and I told my new manager, hey, guess what? I got asked to keynote at Agile Testing Days. Well, she took that to mean, Natalie's a testing expert. We've established the fact that I'm not. Now, before I got the chance to correct her, she started introducing me as, hey, this is Natalie. She's on my team. She's a testing expert. <laughs> oh, boy. So we got caught in that. Like I mentioned, it's not a part of my identity, but identities can change. And how does that relate to cross-functionality? I think that when we talk about cross-functionality, we all have a bit of an identity crisis. We bias ourselves from the very beginning because you can't talk about cross-functionality without talking about functions, without talking about the difference of the functions and the roles that we all play. So I was gonna talk to you about T-shaped people because that's the first thing anyone goes to when they talk about cross-functionality, is that you have that specialty but you also have that broad knowledge. Well, everyone has broad knowledge, but when you take that off the top, 
wow, that specialty really looks a lot like a silo. <laughs> then I was going to talk to you about pie-shaped people, the next best thing, right? Well, shoot, now I have to be good at two things? Again, though, cut that top off. Those are two silos that are part of my identity. And then cone-shaped, comb-shaped, excuse me, well, geez, I just have to be good at everything at this point, right? So we're expanding this definition of cross-functionality to basically say, hey, you as one person have to be able to do absolutely everything on your team. You don't have to be really good at it, but you have to know a little bit about all of it. That doesn't fit with our identities. Okay, now we're asking everybody to be a specializing generalist or a generalizing specialist. What does that even mean? We can't possibly know it all. That's why we have teams. That's why we have programs. That's why we have companies, so that we have everyone to be able to get that job done. Sometimes we need a specialist. Sometimes we don't. But what we need is we need to get the job done. And what is that job that we are trying to get done? We want to delight our customers. Hey, just let that sink in for a minute. That's the job that everybody, regardless of their specialty, of their identity, should be focusing on getting done. And who can do it? Anyone who can do it. So, I told you this talk was trash. I want to tell you that cross-functionality goes beyond development and testing. So I'm going to tell you a little story. There was a waste management company essentially a garbage and landfill company that I was consulting with. And as part of their onboarding, all new employees had to go out on a field visit, if you will. They had to go ride on a garbage truck. Now, the truck drivers kind of had a little bet, especially with the IT people. They bet that all the IT people would uh, get sick because you can kind of imagine the smell, the garbage truck, and I guess quite a few of them did, so it was a pretty decent gamble. But this started with these folks having to get up at 3 a.m. Okay, Everybody gets up at 3 a.m. to go on this ride along. And they go and see the core function of the business. Okay, this is the stuff that makes this business money, makes this business stay alive. Okay, and they go on this ride along and try not to get sick. And one person that was telling me about their experience, I'll never forget. So he was telling me about, well, a couple things. First of all, he said the, the driver went up to a can and picked it up and set it down a couple times. He goes, well, why are you doing that? Oh, well, there's a homeless guy that sometimes sleeps in here, so I want to make sure that he's not in there before I empty it. True story, right? They know their routes. Now, the really impactful part was when they drove up to a construction job site, and the driver's going through and emptying the very large dumpsters and kind of says something to himself. Hmm, I should call our sales guy for this company for this region. And the IT guy next to him kind of looks and says, what are you talking about? He goes, well, look over there. That's not our brand. That's not our, our garbage can. They have a different dumpster here. So I'm going to call our sales guy and let them know that it might be worth a, a follow-up call. They might be looking to switch carriers, or maybe they already did. That floored me. Because here, at the very basis of the business, this garbage collector was breaking down the silo between himself and what he did 
every day on a job function to the sales guy who sits in the office every day. He could see the entire system. He understood the impact that the action that he could take there could have to the business. That's why cross-functionality is beyond just development and testing. And imagine if that garbage collector and that salesperson can break down those silos when they are worlds apart in what they're doing and we can't manage to break down the silos within ourselves between development and test and everything else when we're sitting in the same area, maybe next to each other, maybe we're just a phone call away, right? We have to do better. This reminds me of management X and Y culture, right? Because we're sitting within a system that is keeping us from doing that, from breaking down our own silos. And so I want to talk just a little bit about X and Y management culture. Has anyone heard of this before? Hopefully, a number of people. Okay. So Douglas McGregor from MIT came out with this in the 60s. Basically said, an X manager is someone that thinks that their people are lazy, that their people aren't going to do the work that they need to do unless they're very, very tightly supervised, our command and control culture. Okay, they need rewards to motivate them because they're not motivated by themselves. They're just motivated by that paycheck, by those rewards. Now, looking at why culture, looks happier too, doesn't it? Looking at why culture, it says that, you know what? No, we have the best people for the job and they are intrinsically motivated. Okay? We don't have to be on top of them all the time to ensure that they're doing a good job. Kind of reminds you of that uh, Danielle Pink book, Autonomy, Mastery, and Purpose. Now, thinking about X and Y culture, right? we think that we've moved to a Y culture to an open culture where we trust our people. But at the same time, when we look at certain things within the system, it's clear we're not there yet. I was at a client the other day, literally about two weeks ago, and I brought up cross-functionality. And I, of course, used the developer tester example. And I swear, I could see on his face just this big X. And he said, well, yeah, that's all great, but no. I don't want my developers testing. They have more important things to be doing. Now, I don't think we should be calling one type of work more valuable than another type of work especially when we're looking at the overall system and remembering what the end goal is, right? Our customer. By focusing so much on resource efficiency as the means to the ultimate end, which the ultimate end in that case is resource efficiency for resource efficiency's sake. Right? I need to have my people 100% busy all of the time, working on the most important thing, except the most important thing in the case of that manager was development. Okay? And through those actions, we're creating single points of failure. We're creating our own bottlenecks. That manager didn't understand supply versus demand theory. He didn't understand that when you have three developers all developing and expect one tester to be able to test all that work, it's not going to work. Everyone needs to be helping out. Okay, so we're creating these single points of failure through our culture. Okay, I heard it in this morning's keynote as far as what are all the reasons that these things aren't working. Okay, we need to reverse this mentality. And guess what? We have a lot of people at this conference that can help with that. 
instead of looking to eliminate all the single points of failure, we need to look at eliminating the hero worship that those create. Now, I don't want to eliminate all the great superhero costumes that I saw yesterday. But we have to get away from this firefighting and the people that are doing the firefighting being raised up as heroes because that's killing our perception of valuable work and valuable roles. Think about that example that I'm sure everybody has experienced, right? There's that defect, that pain in the butt defect that keeps coming back and keeps coming back and it's finally fixed and who is the one that gets celebrated? It's the developer that fixed it, not the QA folks that kept finding it. And it was the developer that put it in there in the first place. Those rascals. What I'm trying to get to here is the fact that we focus too much on the wrong things and we're forgetting about the overall customer whole. Okay, we're forgetting about how our own silos and our identities play into these things. I was consulting for a Fortune 100 company and they decided that they were gonna be cross-functional. Didn't give people time to prepare. All of a sudden, everyone's job title was just an engineer. You weren't a developer anymore, you weren't a tester, you were an engineer. You can bet that edict didn't go over very well. They're still dealing with the fallout because we tried to kill people's identities without giving them a chance to reform the identities, to break down their own silos first. We can't do that for people. We have to do it for ourselves first and foremost. So what I want to get to is, again, breaking down those silos of our own identities and realizing that our teams are really only as good as the sum of our parts. Everything is valuable work. If we're not doing it, or if, we're not, if it's not valuable, why are we doing it? Okay, we're only as good as the sum of our parts and the system in which we're constrained. Good ideas can come from anywhere as long as they improve the system. Think back to that garbage truck example. Oh, and here's another garbage example. Let's keep the theme going. Anyone heard of um, President John F. Kennedy? Former President John F. Kennedy? Figured, figured as much. So, back in the 60s, the United States was trying to put a man on the moon. And John F. Kennedy was at NASA. I saw a couple people wearing NASA shirts the other day. He was at NASA walking around and interviewing people about their jobs. And he stopped to talk to the custodian who consequently, I'm gonna say for the purpose of this story, was picking up trash. And he said, what's your job here? And the custodian said, well, I'm putting a man on the moon. I'm helping to put a man on the moon. That alignment, that understanding of your place in the system and the connection to the customer whole. In this case, the customer was essentially the entire world. We were trying to wow the entire world. But understanding, hey, you know what? I know where my place in this customer whole is, and I know how I'm contributing, and I am contributing to that, and I can contribute to that. So, Silicon Valley innovation is robust because of the extensive cross-pollination between individuals and companies. Well, let's cross out Silicon Valley. Innovation is there because we're cross-pollinating and we can't cross-pollinate when we're sitting in our own silos and we're afraid to talk to each other. Again, it's not about making developers testers, it's not about making testers developers. It's about making sure that we're talking to each other 
and we understand the system constraints and our identity constraints. Because disconnect from each other leads to disconnect from the customer whole. Think back to that manager that I was telling you about, who thinks that some work is more valuable than others. He's stuck in his own mindset, and he's not thinking of the customer. I'll give you one more story of a disconnect from the customer whole. And this one actually happened to me on my trip here. So you can see I've had this keynote prepared for a really long time. <laughs> I rented a car. I was at a client last week. And from the beginning, the car rental process was not going great. Got there, I was in a hurry. Had to wait for 30 minutes, there were no cars. I got a car. Car didn't work. I didn't realize this till I was already gone and on the road and it was the next day. Car had some issues. Okay, called, couldn't get the issues resolved. Finally got through some of those internal silos at that particular company to get a new car. That car had problems. Somewhere in between, I left my jacket in the first car because I was just trying to get another car. Well, Germany's not so great without a jacket. Um, I bought a new one. I know you were worried. Okay. It didn't end there. Right. I finally went to return the car, um, and I had forgotten to put gas in it because I was flustered, and actually the thing was the heat didn't work in the second car. Again, I remember I've, I lost my jacket. And I went to talk to the manager, and I was, just, I was really frustrated, and I told him the su succession of the problems that I had had, and to every problem that I told him, the response I got back was, well, I can't help you, that's not my department. Okay, so I finally got frustrated enough and I just said, you know what, just, just forget it. I got, a, I got a flight to catch. So I did what any normal rational person would do. I took it to Twitter. <laughs> so that's where you get everything done. And I got a direct message and I got a call back and I said, you know what? I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble here, but this is really interesting because it's talking about, you know, I'm talking about systems thinking and I can't get through your system. And the woman that I talked to was wonderful. She answered all my questions. She said, you know what? I'm gonna deal with this. I know she probably had to wade through that system too, but she protected me, the customer, from that system. She thought about what I needed to be a satisfied customer and to rent with them again. And essentially she was empathetic. She apologized. She took care of the gas so I didn't get charged $10 a gallon. That's astronomical. Okay, but it showed me that someone there did care about the customer whole. Okay, and what they showed with that, that manager that was on site, he was so disconnected and so stuck within the system that he worked in that he couldn't see any other way out. And that affects our customer experience. And that's the ultimate end game that we're trying to get to. So we make our own limits. We make our own limits by having our internal silos and by being stuck within our systems. If we make them, we can also remove them. That's what they did when I was able to actually talk to a person on the phone. Now, usually it's when you talk to someone face to face that it helps out, but thank you, Twitter. So, what I want to leave you with here is you don't have to be a generalist or a specialist. You have to have the courage to care and to let others care. You have to see your part in the whole system and see where it can change. And not just that. There's a difference between caring and caring enough to actually do something. Because I'm sure that manager at the rental company cared. But he couldn't see his way out of the system and he couldn't care enough to actually do something. So, Changed up my talk a little bit. 
wasn't as impromptu as I wanted you to think it was. I did write some notes on here. No, I didn't. But we talked about the identity crises that we all suffer from internally and how we can't just flip our identity in a flip of a switch to be totally cross-functional, and it's not about that. It's not about being totally cross-functional people. It's ensuring that the sum of all our parts are cross-functional so that we welcome value and ideas from everywhere. And that we can really see where we are in the system and how what we do affects the entire system and that end goal, okay? The means to the ultimate end, which is not resource efficiency. It's delighting the customer. So I want to leave you with this. When we're not thinking about the entire system, garbage on the inside ends up as garbage out. And that's what your customers see. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Questions, questions, questions. Who has questions? No questions at all. Okay, thanks so much. That's for you. So Thank much. you. Thanks so much. It's for you, especially for you, mate. Okay. <laughs>